I'm gonna be straight up with you at the start of this review. I haven't been feeling the love in the gaming world lately, which is actually quite strange when I think about it. This year has seemingly been one hit after another. Nier Automata, Resident Evil 7, Horizon Zero Dawn. This has been one of the strongest starts in recent memory for the gaming world. And yet, it feels like everywhere I look, I find a corruption seeping into the folds of my favorite pastime. Whether it be the focus on microtransactions over a game's quality control, or YouTubers and review outlets misrepresenting the core experience of games left and right. It could feel like the whole system is rotten at its core. Sure, there's a good thing here and there, but sooner or later, the heroes I've worshipped over the past several years seem to have fallen to the darkness. Which is why, when a game like Persona 5 comes along, all you can do is hope for the best. The PS4 exclusive came out on April 4, 2017 for $59.99 and was one of the most anticipated RPGs over the last five years. Even after the various game delays and controversies regarding streaming policies, one thing was clear. Persona 5 was going to be something to look forward to. But that's a lot of expectations to put on one game. And hell, given my attitude lately, I wondered if I really should even bother reviewing the game. My goal is to be as objective and as fair as possible to the games I review. Even if it blew me out of the water with interesting gameplay mechanics or transported me into a wondrous world of color and imagination, would I be able to see it? Would my perception of this world be distorted with my attitude? Ultimately, I chose to review this game because, well, I wanted to. This review was not only for informing people who are still on the fence about this game, but it was to see if I could rekindle that spark. To see if one of my all-time favorite genres, the Japanese RPG, could reignite that spark. Could it find a place alongside The World Ends With You, Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, or would Persona 5 fade from memory in a year's time? Lost to the Void. That's what I'm here to hopefully answer today. But before I begin, this review was done with a free copy of the game obtained from PlayAsia for the purposes of making a review. PlayAsia is an online storefront where you can pick up some of the best anime, gaming, and various other merchandise from overseas. I'm part of their affiliate program, and if you find by the end of this review that you really want a copy of the game, you can use my promo code to get some dollars off if you order via PlayAsia. Now, that won't change my opinion of the game in the end, but you should know where I get games from via FTC guidelines as well as the whole morals thing, you know? In addition, this is a long-ass review, so if you haven't figured it out by now, look at the timestamp. If you don't have the time to see all of this review, I have a five-minute version showing up on the screen right about now. Use that if you don't have the time to listen to me ramble about Persona 5 for about an hour. In addition, you can find links to each section of the review in the description below. Now, I would have used place cards as well, so you could click and move over to each section via the annotation system. But YouTube took that away. Because of course they did. One last note. This is Spoiler Cat. He makes sure that you don't see spoilers. Because you don't want to see spoilers. If he shows up somewhere weird on the screen, you know why. So, will Persona 5 cause a revolution of the Japanese RPG? Will it bring style back to Japanese games in American eyes, even if Japanese games have been of high quality for a while now? Or will it turn out to be another Final Fantasy XV, a good game, but maybe not living up to the overall expectations that were put on it? Or worse? Let's find out, shall we? The Persona series is known for a lot of things, but let's start with the game's story. You play as Akira Kirusu, 
At least that's the canon name based on the manga. But he's commonly referred to in-game as Joker. He's been classified as a juvenile delinquent and has now been placed under the care of one Sojiro Sakura and starts a new year at Sujin Academy. Now, those who have played the game may be going right now, Dragnix, you're sort of missing a bit from the start of the game there. Aren't you going to mention how it actually starts with, no, no I'm not. Here's where this section gets tricky almost immediately. Unlike a lot of Japanese RPGs that I've played in the last 10 years, Persona 5's unique storytelling aspects are ones that I believe you'll want to naturally come across. Some of it is things that the series are known for, but some of them, some of them are not. It's spoilers in a sense, even if it doesn't necessarily spoil any plot detail specifically, but I think it would be a disservice to specifically detail them for those who want to enjoy the game. So I'll be talking a lot of generics going forward in this section. Back to Joker though. He doesn't exactly easily transition in his new school, as his less than stellar past is all over the place, making it hard for him to fit in. He eventually befriends a fellow delinquent in Ruji Sakamoto, but things turn very interesting rather quickly when Joker finds a mysterious app on his phone. This app ends up transferring both him and Ryuji into an alternate world, where monsters named Shadows are around every corner, and everything is just a bit off. What they've come across is a world where the evils of society end up manifesting itself in physical form, the kind of form that can rip them to bits. Luckily, however, Joker isn't exactly your run-of-the-mill student, as he has the flames of rebellion deep inside of him. His personality and his fire ends up manifesting itself as a persona, a being linked to the user that allows him to fight the shadows of the world. Now there's more underlying meaning to what personas are of course, but you'll need to play the game to see what it all truly means. This kicks off an adventure where the code names of Joker, Skull, Panther, and the rest of the playable characters end up fighting under the title known as the Phantom Thieves. Their mission is simple, reform society through these alternate worlds by stealing the treasure within the palaces they come across, leading to change and the defeating of evil. They'll run across various bad guys of all sorts, ranging from the Yakuza to an overly confident teacher hurting his students. Which leads to one of the strongest elements of the game's story, its characters. Joker himself may be a blank template to cast yourself onto, but I'm talking about all the interesting heroes, side characters, and villains that you'll run across during your playthrough. From an up and coming shogi star dealing with the pressures of family and of the limelight, to a shut in who has to break out of her shell to deal with an unfair hand dealt to her. Granted, you've seen the iterations of these characters in plenty of games before, but that doesn't mean that these characters aren't memorable. Far from it, in fact. The Persona team did an excellent job of designing these characters from the ground up. They are simple enough to relate to with a few key personality quirks that they present, but don't overly complicate them with conflicting character traits or creating unfollowable backstories that lose you along the way. But in that simplicity lies really good hook mechanisms, great reasons for why you'd want to know more about these characters and actually give a damn when they run into a conflict. While I really enjoyed a lot of the character arcs here, I have to specifically call out Futaba's entire character because of the brilliance of how the Persona team crafted her story. Everything about Futaba feels so real, to the point where I want to find whoever she's based off of in real life and give them a giant hug. Her complexity of her strengths, fighting her weaknesses, and her ultimate goal in the end leads her down a path that's not only relatable, but one that's downright inspiring. Throw all the merchandise of Futaba that you want at me, Atlas, because you've got a ready and willing customer here. But even beyond that, there is no character that I disliked in this game. Sure, there were characters that I hated, but much like a wrestling heel, they were characters that I was supposed to hate. 
Each of them served a real purpose in the story, down to the smallest bit characters, and their reasons for getting involved actually made sense. It's actually really sad when I think about it. A lot of games nowadays include characters for the sake of hitting certain demographics or plot points that don't really fit well into the story. Persona 5 takes that concept and throws it out the window because every character fits well in the overall puzzle. Actually, now that I think about it, that's sort of a lie on my part. There are two very, very minor characters that don't really add anything to the game. A set of gay characters that are trying to get a few laughs via awkward humor. But I'm going to be honest here. Something about the writing of their characters make me think it was a bad localization attempt more than anything else. I have absolutely no reason or proof to back that up other than a gut feeling. As for other negatives, there are hiccups in characters at times, in particular with the male side characters and the hammering home of some of their negative quirks. Yes, Ruji is overly emotional about everything and is a little bit of a bird brain at times, but it's almost like they forgot about his positive quirks in certain story arcs. This is the same for Yusuke, who goes into the starving artist trope once too often for my liking. Now, the reason I say male side characters is that this isn't as prominent for the female characters. Sure, Anne shows off that she's a little bit of an airhead at times, but that's usually contrasted with her kindness and the devotion to her friends. Okay, beyond the characters, the themes of the game center around the idea of a corrupt system and a ragtag group of rebels trying to fix that system with their overwhelming virtues and determination. So basically the story of most Japanese RPGs over the last 20 years. However, here it's done in a chapter-like format, despite not being divided into them. Each segment of gameplay is split into different stories, in which the crew takes on one big figure within the world and tries to take him or her down. Or it in some cases. These chapters do a great job of presenting different society or personal issues and transforming them into threats that the Phantom Thieves have to deal with in both the palace world and the real world. Each of them feel distinct enough with their own subtopic they hit on regarding the evils of the world, but they connect well to moving the overall plot forward as well. Again, each piece feels purposeful with no unnecessary fluff to drag out the game either. I have to emphasize that despite there being giant shadows, alternate realities, and the ability to summon demons from your own head, Persona 5's plot feels realistic. The fantastical elements are grounded in reality enough to make it feel like this world is one that could truly exist. That's because the writing team here may have made some crazy moments, some diabolical plots, and some insane twists, but all of them are seated in basic human reactions and emotions. Nothing feels out of place here, that it was just thrown in there to get that OMG moment. It fits in there like a puzzle piece. I'm truly impressed at the weaving of the story. Take the first mission which deals with a volleyball coach and how he's treating the student body. Each of the characters involved in the plot has a connection to the ongoing plot that makes sense for why they be involved. Sure, you can say that one of the characters is only involved because his or her best friend is involved, but here's the key to that. That character's connection with that friend is expanded on later if you decide to listen to his or her story via the confidant system. It's those kinds of connections that continue on in the game, ones that don't just show up when it's convenient, that makes a great plot. One that's completely woven not just stapled on. Here's the thing too, even when there is a perceived plot hole in the game, something that may not make sense with the character's personality or what has happened in the events of the game, I still found a way to justify it. This point was thanks to a discussion I had with a colleague at TechRaptor, talking about Morgana's character and what happens to him towards the end of the game. While he brought up points that I could consider issues, I found ways that it makes sense given Morgana's character and the purpose he serves in the plot. In addition, I will give the writers a lot of credit 
for making mundane moments memorable enough to play a vital role in the plot later on. Even games like my beloved Danganronpa series can struggle with this at times, and that game series is designed to be a mystery, one in which the whole purpose is to find the contradiction in the plot. But somehow, Persona 5 made it so that a small discussion that happened 10 hours into the game was easy for me to remember at the 100 hour mark, to the point where I saw a key event coming up. The amount of fantastic foreshadowing and symbolism became apparent when I started going through my footage for this video. I caught new things that I would never have seen coming at the time. Never see How about this? What she said. And when I think back on it, I really should have. Not only does this make the game worthy to play through several times to see everything that you may have missed, but it really rewards players who slowly take their time to appreciate every connection that they can see. And hell, even appreciate the connections that they make that ultimately turn out to be false. Speaking of characters, please note that our main character can romance other characters through the confidant system. Now, it is a little concerning that Joker is apparently an incubus, considering that every woman in the game seems to fall in love with him no problem. Okay, with maybe one or two exceptions. But the romance is surprisingly built up in ways that feel reasonable. Sure, romancing a teacher is a trope of Japanese culture, and still makes me shudder a tiny bit. And yet, doing it in this game feels reasonable and natural thanks to the chemistry between the two characters. Look, I could go on all day about this story, but like I mentioned at the start of this section, I really don't want to spoil that much for you. If you've seen my reviews before, you know that I take video game storytelling very seriously, especially for long RPG type games. And Persona 5 is one of the best ones in recent memory. Sure, it has very minor flaws, but you really won't care as you throw yourself into the next challenge, waiting to see what happens to Joker and the rest of the Phantom Thieves. All right, all right, I've gushed long enough about the story in Persona 5, so it's time to change gears. The Japanese RPG formula has surprisingly gone absent in the AAA gaming world nowadays. Hell, even one of the staples of the genre, the Final Fantasy series, has removed it a bit and gone with a more action-based RPG formula. So it would seem at first that Persona 5 is carrying a legacy system to the modern day in terms of its gameplay, and it may suffer because of it. And it does anything but that, because surprise, surprise, the JRPG formula still is fun from a strategic standpoint. Sorta of wish that the rest of the industry realized that. Now, there's several different mechanics that create the overall gameplay package here, but let's start with the core of the strategic gameplay, investigating palaces, aka dungeons, and working your way to the end, fighting various shadows ready to kill you around every turn. Now, as mentioned before, your job is simple as a phantom thief. Steal the area's treasure and defeat the bad guy. I mean, you're a thief, that's what you do. Now, unlike other RPGs in the genre, however, there's a time limit involved in the dungeon's completion. Again, without spoiling anything, let's just say that the treasure will be locked away forever if you don't swipe it within the allotted time. This leads to one of the first main gameplay mechanics of the game, dungeon crawling. At the opening of a palace, you'll get a series of objectives that you'll have to complete ranging from finding a key to figuring out how to disable a series of lasers protecting the next area. Actually, pretty much every objective involves you finding a way to unlock a door. They do their best to mix up the system so that you don't realize that, but you'll soon realize the rigid structure of the gameplay loop after a while at least. Now, the palace's master won't make it easy for you, as on top of some minor traps that they'll set, he'll have shadows roaming the entire dungeon. As a Phantom Thief, you've got a couple of options here. You can attack every enemy head-on, of course, but that doesn't mean you'll be taking advantage of the game's stealth systems. It's better to sneak around, using the shadows to try to hide from your enemies, and more importantly, get the jump on them. Surprising an enemy gives you an initiative in battle, while getting surprised yourself 
means that you're at the disadvantage and can't run from the battle and are gonna take a hell of a lot of damage very quickly. Sneaking around is honestly rather clunky. You've got certain spots that you can snap to when sneaking up on people, but sometimes you'll end up clinging to them a little too much, or you'll end up jumping to a spot that you really didn't want to. It will take a little bit of time for you to get used to this, but it's helped by the fact that the enemy AI movement patterns are rather simple, and somewhat stupid at times. Level design in this aspect is rather simple, but isn't repetitive at all, mostly linear with only a few secondary paths. Most of the stealth aspects really come down to timing and patience, but I'll be honest here, it pales in comparison to the JRPG combat, so you'll only probably use it to get the jump on people, and for something I'll reveal later on in this video. So let's move on to Persona 5's bread and butter, its turn-based combat system. You and three other allies will go up against an allotment of different shadows, including this monstrosity. Before you ask, yes, this is a continuing monster of the series, and while it's a joke to some people, when I think of horrifying things to go up against, this is sort of at the top of the list. Now, the base of this gameplay is the JRPG standard you've come to expect. You can directly attack enemies using weapons, along with casting offensive, defensive, and support magic via your persona. You can guard from attack to reduce damage for a turn as well, but most of these elements are pretty standard for the genre, even as I reveal later on that they may be implemented in some creative ways. One addition is your ability to fire your gun, which has a limited amount of bullets in a dungeon. This is a stronger physical attack that you'll want to use in the right situations, as it's more likely to knock enemies off their feet given repeated use, but you've got to weigh that with enemies that have an innate weakness to it. See, one of the more unique factors in this combat system has to do with elemental weaknesses and the knockdown system. Similar to games like Pokemon, each shadow will have elements that it's strong and weak against. If you hit an enemy with an element that it's weak to, it will not only take additional damage, it will get knocked down. Now, unlike Pokemon, the elemental system here is done in a pair type system. For example, fire hurts creatures that are mainly ice aligned and vice versa. The only two that really fall out of those pairings are physical and gun attacks, and yes, they are considered elements in this game. But knocking down an enemy is where the game gets rather interesting, because of all the different things it can lead to. Let's start with the simplest, however, the baton pass system. Your character who just knocked an enemy down can now go again, choosing to attack himself or tagging in another character in the party. This baton pass comes with increased strength and recovery, meaning that you can hit harder or heal for more. Now, as long as you can knock an enemy down that wasn't knocked to the floor before, you can continue this pattern, getting up to three to four enemy chains depending on your team. Now, if you knock every enemy down, you have even more options, but let's focus on the elemental portion and the knockdown system of the fight here first. Now, there's something else I should mention here. The enemy can also do this to you. Depending on your persona, you can get knocked down if you get a weakness hit on you and take not only heavy damage, but give them another turn as well. Now, for some characters that you have, you won't be able to avoid that if you want to exploit enemy weaknesses. Again, going back to the pair element system. What makes the system fascinating is the distribution of your magic among your personas and your characters. Each of the side characters has one to two elements at max, mostly one, while Joker himself could theoretically have every element depending on how you build him. But therein lies the dilemma, as each character has only a specific amount of SP, aka magic points, and within a dungeon, there's no regular equivalent to an in or a save point heal for SP points. If you want to recover SP, you'll need to leave the dungeon and come back another day, which plays into the game's time system. So now the decision making and strategy is taken to the next level. Sure, I can knock all the enemies down with one big ice spell, but shouldn't I save some SP for later on when I truly, truly need it? Which of my teammates do I need to bring along in order to exploit those weaknesses of a particular dungeon? 
Should I keep a lower power spell in my arsenal to test elemental weaknesses for enemies I don't know? Or should I just keep the more powerful one? Hell, remember the stealth portion I mentioned earlier? Yeah, this is where you'd actually consider it. Enemies, even if you focus on physical damage and avoid using SP, can still do reasonable chunks of damage in routine fights if it gets to their turn. And if you're at their level, you're not going to be able to knock them out in one go around. Let's be clear too, this isn't the type of game you really can take a fight off if you're in one of the main dungeons, especially at the harder difficulties. Sure, there are enemies that are weaker than others, of course, but you'll find as soon as you start just hitting the attack button and not dealing with the consequences, all of a sudden, half of your party has status afflictions and you're wasting SP left and right trying to deal with it. Getting through a dungeon is about the journey, not about the moment, as you'll want to try to get through dungeons in one go if you can, considering what I will talk about later on in this video. But okay, stepping back a second, it should be clear that the game relies mostly on strategy and planning rather than just pure stats or levels, as each fight feels like it actually means something. In addition, fights don't necessarily feel drawn out, even if it takes a couple of rounds to take down your enemy. Animations are relatively short, but you're also not taking six rounds to knock out just one enemy. You're pretty efficient. The challenge curve here, depending on the difficulty you select, is pretty right on, always keeping you engaged, introducing new mechanics and elements in a timely fashion, or keeping your head right next to the sander if you're at high difficulties. I played the game on normal difficulty, despite having reasonable experience in the Japanese RPG genre, and even I was having trouble despite that past experience. Now granted, I could have played on hard, but let's be honest, this review is over two months old as it is. I needed to save some time somewhere. The ultimate tests are the boss fights, which always seem to have something new that you'd have to deal with that you had some experience dealing with before, but it was just amped up to 11 this time. Even if you're at full HP or SP, it may take one, two, three attempts to get through these fights to help avoid that major hit or performing the right buff at the right time. In fact, I can't think of a boss that I didn't struggle with on the first attempt, of the main bosses anyway, and that's a rarity in games like this. But on the other hand, I didn't struggle to the point where I wanted to hurl the PS4 out of the window. Well, except at the end game. There's one other system that I should mention here, the negotiation system. If you're able to knock down all enemies in one go, then you have the chance to hold up the enemy team. From there, you can do a stylish all-out attack for major damage, which is always cool to see. But the more interesting option is negotiating with the shadows. Here you can demand items, money, or even their services in exchange for their life. For their services, you'll have to try to convince them if they are of an equivalent level to you, and it can blow up in your face if they refuse you and then get the first attack once it goes back to the main battle. This feature is important to earn valuable items in Persona, and once again is something you'll need to consider using your SP on, because guess what? Some of those items you get are pretty rare, and this is where you'll earn the big chunks of money to spend on upgrades. It's just another system to balance with the rest of them, and it always feels good to get a new persona after you threaten their life. No complaints here. Okay, what's the downside to this combat system? Well, I will say one thing stands out to me, and it's the reliance on Joker. Well, sort of. Actually, I'm not so sure if I think it's a huge negative. <clears throat> Let me explain. Joker is the key linchpin to the party in one other way that I haven't mentioned yet. If he gets killed, it's game over. It doesn't matter if the rest of your party is at full health or if you have 99 revives in your item slot. If Joker goes down, it's game over. Which means that if you so happen to take a nice critical hit out of nowhere, the last 30 minutes of dungeon crawling may be undone which never feels good at all, and can honestly feel real cheap at times. One other negative is the last dungeon of the game, which really stretches out your team rather thin at times. The game hasn't really given this much of an onslaught up to this point, and while yes, this is the climax of the game, it feels like it's asking for too much, especially if you went down certain paths in your upgrade system. 
I myself ran out of key recovery SP items in particular, and with the reliance on magic and weakness exploiting in this game, that was a nail in the coffin that forced me to reload in an earlier save. Now, a JRPG wouldn't be a JRPG if you didn't have the ability to customize your party to meet your own needs. The whole RP part of the JRPG. And while yes, you can customize your characters with different armor and weaponry that can change the battle significantly, my favorite weapon being Anne's whip that could inflict the spare of course, the real customization is going to come via the personas. Now, as I mentioned, each side character has one persona and element type that they'll have throughout the game, but you'll really need to think about how you want to build your side characters. Personas have an eight slot skill limit, and it'd be easy to just take the next powerful spell when they level up. But let me tell you something about this game. The buff and dispel skills in this game can be crucial to your success. Then there's Joker himself, and his ability to have multiple personas and different types. And that's where the Pokemon and Monster Hunter elements of Persona 5 come into play, thanks to the Velvet Room. In this room, you're able to train personas to get new abilities and resistances, along with combining personas to make new ones and inherit skills from their parents. It is very easy to just start combining personas to get the most powerful ones in your arsenal and not think about elemental weaknesses or skills at all. If you're playing on the harder difficulty, however, you might as well be pissing in the wind. Because here's the thing, Joker is the linchpin of your team. He's going to be the one that will have to fill in for where your team lacks at a certain point. If your healer is forgetful, sure you could use an item for him to be recovered but sooner or later, Joker is going to have to step into that role. He is the jack of all trades. He is the wild card. He is the Joker. This becomes extremely apparent at the end of the game, when you really have to be careful about going all out on an enemy when enemies are buffing themselves constantly or needing to be debuffed to do significant damage. Sure, you can have one designated persona that has the debilitate ability, but what if you run into an enemy that is the weakness for that persona? What then? Maybe you need a second one with it. You'll spend a lot of time trying to craft the perfect team, and that has the addiction of a Pokemon breeder leveling that Pokemon has. It's really fun to try to create the ultimate team. Now, the other major gameplay part of the game has to do with your daily social life and routine. When you're not in the dungeon or fighting for the Phantom Thieves, you'll have various scripted events to attend, as well as decisions to make on what to do with your free time. There's a huge city and various places to explore, arcades, restaurants, libraries, and ancient shrines. And you'll need to spend your time wisely, because every decision will help you improve in getting through those palaces. You'll need to pick up recovery items from the pharmacy, upgrade your weapons at the local airsoft shop. Oh, and of course, win the hearts of as many people as possible through the confidant system. Spending time with various members of the community will increase your relationship with them. Each of these confidant relationships have a small storyline that will be core to the character and their personality, and you'll want to do them all. Too bad that you only have a certain amount of time to do them in. Considering each of the paths have elements that you'll find useful in your forays into the palaces, you'll need to decide which of these relationships are worth your time, which you won't know what they are at first. Sure, they give you a hint of what they can teach you, but some of the best skills in the game aren't obvious matches to the characters until you start their route. For example, you know that the kid at the arcade will help you with gun skills, but you really won't know exactly what those skills are until you obtain them. This is one of the reasons you'll really want to have multiple save files, just in case you need to reconfigure along the way. Now normally I don't provide hints to the game and want people to naturally find their own way in terms of gameplay. However, there are a couple of cases in this game where no, I really think that if you want to do even okay on your first run, that you really need to know a good starting order for the confidence to maximize them at first. So in the description below, I'll provide the hints for which ones to focus on, referring to their confidant type. Again, I won't spoil anything here, 
as you'll need to have played the game to figure out the hints I'm giving you, but the information will be there for your disposal. But I love this system. Now, I'm a fan of SLGs in visual novels anyway, but the real awesome part of Persona 5's confidant system is that it actually is a key point to doing better within the palaces. Even skills that could be considered standard in certain other games actually end up being unlocks here, like the ability to switch out a teammate in the middle of battle. That's a huge skill for this game, but you'll need to find the confidant and level them up to unlock it. It makes all the work that you've done up to the point in that game feel like it makes a huge difference, and it can lead to some fantastic moments in gameplay. Y you want an example, of course, right? Okay. In one of the final battles of the game, Joker was about to go down, which of course meant a game over. But I had unlocked the level 9 confidant relationship with Panther. This allowed her to jump in the way of a fatal attack to Joker and take it herself. She sacrificed herself in order to save Joker. Unlike scripted cutscenes or plot devices that are needed to create an epic moment, that moment was my own. I'm the one who chose to spend time upgrading Panther. I'm the one who ignored other relationships at times to get her up to level 9. I had earned her friendship, and it paid off for me in the end. I felt not only justified, I leapt into the air with my fist pumped out, as that was the turning point in the battle. I won because I chose Panther. So basically, my summary of gameplay in Persona 5 is this. Why haven't I played more of the Persona series? I mean, I've played an hour or two here and there, but I'm sitting here wondering how the hell I missed this series for so long, being a self-professed RPG fan that I am. I feel like my supposed expertise has been shattered by this game because I ignored that series. Because quite frankly, Persona 5's gameplay is not only rock solid, it was enjoyable even at the end of the game, after 150 hours. That's saying something. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the technical section of Persona 5, because it has a lot less of an impact in the game's big picture compared to the other segments of this review, the whole Japanese RPG thing being the main factor in that. However, Persona 5 is starting off a little behind here, as the game was originally slated for the PlayStation 3 not the PlayStation 4. Luckily, the delays the game underwent have shown here in a good way, as the game's engine may be lacking compared to other technical marvels right now, but it's solid where it needs to be. The first thing to note here is that when it comes to bugs of any sort in the engine, I didn't really see any, which is impressive because this engine was built for the ground up for this game. Now, doing my research, there are some silly bugs out there, such as an odd T-pose for an NPC, or the audio going absolutely insane in some of the menus. But let me be clear, in my 150 plus hours in my main playthrough of the game, I did not experience a bug that I would consider over a trivial cosmetic bug. That says something for the polish of this game, but for the sake of completeness for this review, here's some bugs that I did find along with links in the descriptions to those people's channels. I'm flying. We. <sighs> God. I just had a soft block in Persona 5. This is great. I gotta freaking reload a save now. Because I, I went over here to open this door. And then the game just stopped. I don't even know what happened. Like, I clicked X to open the door, uh, and now the music stopped. I don't, I don't know what just happened. I might have to reload this. This kind of sucks. Now, I will say that when it comes to graphical fidelity, Persona 5 does lack compared to other various games that are coming out in 2017. Despite the strong art direction, models are rather simple in terms of polygon usage. It's missing a certain sharpness at times, especially when it's only human characters around and the crew aren't in costume. With that said, it never really bothered me that much because the presentation and the art direction well make up for it. Now, even with that said, 
there was one thing that did stand out from a technical perspective. Pop in. Sometimes when a cutscene would start, it was obvious that the game wasn't ready to go, as you'd see character models even in the foreground, loading while the scene starts up. That happens often enough for it to be annoying from the social link side of the gameplay. However, that's not the same case for combat where it mysteriously disappears. Weird, but I guess it's more responsive where it truly counts, aka the action. As for load times, I'll give an example here, but I generally found them to be quite small, usually under 20 seconds at the worst case. It's helped by a presentation a bit with some of the animated portions during the start of them, which distract you very nicely. But I never sat there twiddling my thumbs, waiting for the game to start, which I distinctly remember from doing in Final Fantasy XV. As for performance, the game runs at 30 FPS at 1080p. Yeah, I know, 30 FPS. While there are action scenes and movement scenes in the game that would have really benefited from 60 FPS, I'm gonna let this one slide considering that this is a turn-based RPG. And the fact is, the 30 FPS is rock solid on the PlayStation 4. And I mean rock solid, as I saw no drops during my gameplay. Now, for those who have a PS3 and are considering to get the game on that platform, I do have to warn you on something. Now, while the graphics are mostly comparable, despite boosted shadows and other smaller graphical elements being a slight bit better on the PlayStation 4, there's a big problem with the PlayStation 3 version. Screen tearing. It's all over the place. Now, for more information on that, I'd consult Digital Foundry's video on the subject. Nevertheless, that's a dehancer for anyone who's picking up the PlayStation 3 version, because you are getting an inferior product here. The biggest complaint I have about Persona 5's technical element is the lack of options in terms of customizing the experience, but that comes with a caveat. See, the options available, as you can see on the screen here, are very specific to the game experience. Things like the game remembering the last Persona you used, and the ability to display subtitles for the animation sequences. Now, I always appreciate the game going beyond the standard options available for the specific experience. It tries to help you in that regard. With that said, it's still lacking. And I'm not talking about things like the ability to configure your controller via bindable keys. I'd like to have that, of course. But to me, it's a lot less necessary in a Japanese RPG where you're not being asked to rapidly respond. I'm more talking about things like sound sliders. I love the ability to adjust the music compared to the sound, compared to the voices, and I can't hear. That sort of really sucks. Overall, while the technical elements play a lot smaller part in Persona 5 than in other games, that doesn't mean that it isn't worth noting. While it may lack in areas compared to those other games, it does the job enough for you to appreciate all the other elements of the game. The gameplay, the story, and as you're about to hear, the presentation. It's really all you can ask for. Oh, don't think that I'm done praising Persona 5 at this point. Because even with its fantastic story, some rock solid gameplay, and some reasonable technical elements, Persona 5's knockout punch is its presentation. Persona 5 is the definition of style, and it's a template on which games in the future should look to for reference. What's fascinating is that this is in every element of the presentation of this game, down to the game's loading screens and even the menus of all things. Let's start with the character design. Now, the non-Palace World character designs are pretty standard and stereotypical for what you would expect out of a JRPG. The pretty boy protagonist, the rough and hardened delinquent, the refined and naive princess. However, like the characters' personalities, the characters' designs are simple yet have a way of being iconic somehow. It's thanks to the design twisting things just a tiny bit so that you really remember them. Things like Futaba's jacket and the fact that she always wears it past her shoulders. You've seen the jacket type before, but maybe not worn that way, and it sticks out. Or it's a design that makes sense, yet you wouldn't have thought of it. Haru, the aforementioned princess character, for example, wears an iconic turtleneck. 
It makes a lot of sense given the character. And yet it wouldn't have been my first thought when it comes to her design stereotype. This is taken to the next level with the persona transformations and the Phantom Thieves costumes. The design does so well in characterization, but Koto being the prime example that I'm going to use here. Her real self doesn't seem like the biker chick if you look at her position in life and what she shows on the surface. And yet, when you see her transformation, it makes a lot of sense. The simplicity of her mask design, matching her logical and functional lifestyle, and yet you see that scar, stereotypical of a person on a journey with its length, but it matches her character's search for her true calling in life. Monster design is interesting as well. There's definitely a lot of influence from God in monster culture here, as a lot of creatures have roots in Japanese history and various mythologies, creatures like the Tengu, for example. But once again, they have slight twists that make them relatively unique here. Remember this guy from before? Well, you may not realize that it's actually based on Buddhist mythology, but the addition of the chariot-like device that it rides it gives it a real element of mystery. Why a chariot? Why does it exist? I want to know more about this horrifying creature. And that's a good design if I ever heard of one. Now, in-game models do suffer a tiny bit due to the lack of some graphical fidelity here, but it's not to the point where it's a major distraction. You can still clearly see the details of the character's clothing, and it still looks stylish, even if it doesn't compare whatsoever to the portrait and cutscene art. That's more of a praise for that artwork, which is sharp and really, really stylish. As for the environmental design, this may be the weakest part of the game's presentation, but that's not necessarily saying much. The different areas that you will end up in throughout the game range from a stereotypical bank environment to a bustling amusement park, and the details of each of these environments captures the story's mood and themes, for the most part at least. The devil is in these details. It's very easy to miss a lot of the hints about the game's plot and the little additions that the art design team made here, like this Japanese yen symbol being on this door. If you look closely, the environment has a lot to say about everything in the game, even if what you're looking at is rather boring in certain cases. The reason I say boring isn't because there's a lack of things to look at. It's actually quite the opposite at times. The busy streets that you'll go down have so many things around it that it's really hard to focus on one thing at times. It's just a set of flashing lights and overall sensory overload, which is a feeling of itself, of course. But in that, it's really easy to miss some of the interesting references made within the products and posters that the game puts forward. And then there's the game's UI. And I'm going to be honest here. I hate the UI of this game. I hate it because it set the bar so goddamn high. I now look at other UIs that I considered pretty excellent in the Japanese RPG genre, and they look meh in comparison. Persona 5's UI is not only sleek and fits the themes of the game, but it's the way that each element flows into the next, making the transitions to each page feel so natural. I never thought I could fall in love with menus and actually enjoy going through them in a game. It helps that the color scheme is so damn appealing to me in the main menus, of course, being the red fanatic that I am. But it's more than that. It's all the little elements that show the tremendous amount of polish put into this game. It's your character running through the experience screen, naturally weaving in and out of the important information that gets you involved. It's little things like the battle character icon, changing when it's your character's turn, showing that it's ready for you to battle with him or her. It's the way that the menu system centers on the character, making them the star of the show. It's so good, in fact, that I'm going to link this ongoing project for an Android theme in the style of Persona 5's in-game phone UI. Because it's that good. And I want my phone to have it too. All right, let's talk a little bit about sound design now. The sound design here is one that I would call enhanced central. 
It's there to really complement the visual choices here, but doesn't really stand out by itself. The sound of a gunshot is clear, and does a good job of portraying the damage that a bullet would hit an enemy with. But yet, it's the little touches like the jingle as the rip portrait hits the battle screen? That's Persona 5's sound design's bread and butter. The one thing I will say is that remember how I wanted audio sliders before? Well, I had trouble hearing some of the sound effects in this game at their natural tone. Now, I do think I have some damage hearing thanks to a project I undertook a while back, but I had real trouble hearing things like footsteps within this game, and really would have loved to change those volume levels. Regardless, take a listen to some sound design examples to hear what the game has to offer. Hmm. Moving on to the voice acting, the quality of the performances here, in my opinion, is very high, mostly due to the fact that the voice actors understood their characters inside and out. It's more than just the quality of the regular lines and the emotion that they put into it. It's the little character twists. Things like the laugh of Hutaba after she delivers her iconic snark, or how Haru's voice just feels like it's about to crack at any moment. Even beyond the main cast, the minor voice work also stands out as well, as the little quips that monsters threw at me actually made me turn my head going, wait, what the hell did you just say to me? Now, as for Japanese versus English voice acting, it all really depends on the characters for me. For example, I think the Japanese voice for Yusuke works a lot better due to the refinement it has, and I like the more roughness out of Anne's Japanese voice actress for her character arc. But on the other hand, the English Ryuji gets a lot more energy out of his performance and fits the character to the T, while characters like Makoto feel a lot more natural with their English voice. Now I'll give you an example of both sides here, but really, you can't go wrong if you choose either of them. Hey, you don't gotta answer her honestly. So you're just, you're just the good just girl type to push over. Right now, you're useless to me. I'm not. What was that? Fine. I'll help you meet Kanashiro. What exactly is she planning on doing? She had a dead serious look in her eyes. This should be a familiar flavor. Yet how does it taste so good? What's up, Makoto? You ain't eating much. Uh, oh, um... Not feeling well or something? You just don't get it, do you, Ryuji? When a girl's in a swimsuit, she wants to look as slim as possible. Still, you're worrying too much. Did you make sure to eat breakfast? Mona lacks tact. So, what do we do now? Should we play some beach volleyball? Oh, sorry. Us girls already made plans to ride a banana boat. We could only rent a three-person one. Sorry. Wait, then what about us? Keep an eye on our stuff. Hell no! Oh, 
と去年より全然多いそりゃそうだろう有名になっちまったし怪盗団に鴨志田に校長しかもゲストが明智だぜ私服警官とかいるかもっていうかいるわね多分会話の内容気をつけないと普通の学生っぽさが大事だな学園祭って浮いてんな相変わらずうんおうんあいつまんねえなあ And then finally, let's talk about the music. The horribly addictive music that won't get out of your head and will actually get you to dance to it despite having no dancing abilities whatsoever and make you wonder if anyone in the office actually saw you doing it. This unfortunately is the scenario I got myself caught into. And I really hope the office doesn't have hidden cameras. <laughs> There's a bit of variety of music in the soundtrack as a whole, but the most memorable music I'd classify as jazz, with a touch of disco of all things. Even within the genres of the music, you hit strong ranges from slow piano sets that get you into a relaxing mood to an upbeat ensemble while you run towards the boss in the area to take him down. There's over a hundred different pieces here, Several of them, though, are slight alterations of a bass piece to match the mood to the situation. More surprisingly, they all work. I can't think of a soundtrack that has gotten me more into the mood of a game than Persona 5's soundtrack did for that specific moment. That's in a year that's been pretty good with that premise in games like Nier Automata. In terms of overall quality, the vocal tracks are the best. Which is surprising coming from me, as I usually don't like them within a game's gameplay, unless they're in iconic moments. That's not the case in Persona 5, as they all work extremely well in pretty much every situation. I will say that only having two battle themes for the most part was a little bit annoying, despite how good the battle music was. It took a long time for me to get annoyed by it, almost 90% into the game. But in the end, I wish they had a little bit more variety there. Look, just listen to the music here and tell me it's not good. You're not going to be able to. Presentation in a Japanese RPG is always of secondary importance when it comes to the overall package, but Persona 5 shows how a fantastic implementation of it can take a game from a great level to a shining gem level. It shows how much art and graphical design work 
can influence the overall product to the point where it is the industry benchmark that other games will have to weigh itself against. And right now, all those games would lose. In the end, I started this review trying to find a game that would reignite the spark in me for gaming coverage. And you'd think that gushing about this game for over the past hour, that it's clear that Persona 5 is my game of the year by far. That it was exactly what I needed to break me out of this funk that I'm in. And yet, it may have made things even worse in the end. Because Persona 5 is so unstereotypical of the gaming world right now that it stands alone. Yes, even with the DLC. It's the shining template for developers to look at to see how you pull off a fantastic story that in essence you've probably heard before. How you take a genre that has been called stale and yet breathe new life into it. And how design and vision can transform a game via its presentation. And that's when it sorta hit me. Was my upset with the gaming world lately caused by Persona 5? That I saw a game that did things so magically, so beautifully, that I wondered why others weren't doing the same. Sure, I saw similarities with games like Nier Automata, but I realized that my reviews of Straight, of Ukulele, were probably negatively affected by Persona 5. That's because I was playing both of them at the same time, and it was clear that I wanted to play more Persona 5 while I was reviewing those games. I still haven't necessarily found the answer to my own personal demons regarding gaming coverage right now. But I did find answers. More specifically, I found that Persona 5 will live on in my top games of all time. I will remember Joker, Futaba, Makoto, and his various friends and their fight against society. I will remember the love and dedication put into every element of this game, down to the menu system that many developers overlook. But Persona 5, it didn't. It will be a game that I replay this year. That alone should tell you something. With all the coverage that I do, I rarely replay games. Persona 5 is the exception to that rule. Persona 5 is a game that makes me smile. It makes me laugh. It makes me cry. With all the factors taken into account, Persona 5 earns the highest score ever given to a game on this channel, a 98 out of 100. That means it's a must buy, which fans already knew was the case given my gushing on it on Twitter. But in case I haven't made this obvious, go pick up Persona 5 if you haven't already. Oh, but you may be saying to yourself, Dragnix, what about your enhancer system? For those of you who don't know, that score that I just gave is only the base score. However, games nowadays are too specialized and can appeal to too many people in more subjective ways. Whether it be really liking stealth mechanics and needing them in your games, or not liking a certain topic that a story goes down, that's where my enhancer system comes into play. You apply these values if you fall strongly into that category, and only if you strongly fall into that category. If the first digit of your score changes, then you should refer to my scoring guide in the description below. At least, that's what I would say normally. But you may notice something. No matter what configuration of enhancers that you use, the score doesn't fall under 90. In fact, it can go over 110 in some cases, meaning that no matter what, you should probably buy this game. I mean, really, buy this game. It has my seal of approval, which is an actual seal, by the way. He comes to your door, and if you don't buy the games, he slaps you with a fish. Avoid fish beatings if you can. Anyway, I thank everyone who has stayed this long and watched this entire review. I know that I have a lot to say about this game, but the reason that you probably stayed this long is that you like to hear detailed analysis, and hopefully I delivered that. As for the next review I'll be taking up, I really have no idea. I mean, this one took a bit of time with the whole over 150 hours of gameplay and the reasonably long review. 
so I'm going to play it by ear for now. But if you want a specific game reviewed, let me know in the comments section below. Anyway, this is Dragonix signing out, letting you know that while you're watching this, I'm probably replaying Persona 5 right now. But as always, remember to keep on gaming, and I'll see you next time.